Hey everybody, so in our latest interview, I sit down with Eddie O'Day, who last month was the first person to complete the full Eastern Divide Trail, or EDT, a route from Cape Spear, Newfoundland, which is the easternmost part of North America, all the way to Key West, Florida. The EDT follows as much of the St. Lawrence and Eastern Continental Divides as possible without compromising a focus on quality off-pavement riding and connecting the most incredible sites, landmarks, and of course, landscapes in the Eastern Mountains. Eddie shares as much detail as a 40 minute conversation would allow, talking about his bike, the gearing, route highlights, weird moments on route, which include a crashed wedding and a random piano in the middle of nowhere. He also talks about his love-hate relationship with Canada and much, much more. Before we jump into the interview, I just wanna mention that this video is supported in part by Surly Bikes. And Surly, they make serious steel bikes for people that don't take themselves too seriously. They make bikes that are versatile and durable that can be dressed up or down for commuting, bike packing, ATBing, gravel grinding, or really whatever you call fun on two wheels. With 15 original dirt-friendly platforms, they offer something that fits just about anyone for any style of riding. So for more about Surly, make sure to click this card right here, or there's a link in the description below. All right, let's get to the interview. Thanks for, uh, for joining me today. Yeah, no problem. Um, so we'll just jump right into some of these questions here um, to get this conversation started. So where, where are you from, Eddie, and what do you do for a living? I kind of float between Atlanta and Birmingham, um, and I do bike fitting and uh, technique instruction. So I teach people how to move better. So you're, you're a bike fitter. For people that don't know what that is, because that's something that's super, um, super beneficial for cyclists, especially people that ride their bike long distances, give us like a quick like bike fitting 101. Like what do you do? What do you look for? What do you look at when um, you have an appointment? I um, use a system called WN Precision. So that involves um, a series of skeletal and range of motion measurements uh, with that individual. While I'm going through that process, we'll also sort of talk about you know, what kind of riding they're doing and what their goals are, what their aches and pains are, so I sort of know areas of focus. Um, but that system will give me a blueprint to get their bike set up. So whether it's you know, road, mountain, gravel, cross, whatever. Um, and that's sort of the, the starting point in getting the bike set up. Um, and then as we apply that and that's how that gets applied sort of dependent on the bike, like road bikes are a little more static where a mountain bike, somebody has got to be on their bike to get things, you know, sag set and that kind of stuff. So, um, but we'll get those measurements applied and then start working through, um, just the absolute basics from how to address the saddle, like what, where should you be sitting and how should that feel? And, um, to getting into the nuances of what's, what's an efficient pedal stroke for, for each individual and each, each application. Um, and then building on that into more and more specific techniques for different situations. So like yeah. everything from like saddle height to saddle tilt to reach all of that stuff you deal with. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, everything you touch on the bike from the cleats to your brake levers is going to get dialed in. Um, not to say any of that's ever set in concrete, but it gives sort of a nice baseline. And then if issues come up after that, then we have a, at least a baseline of measurements applied and then we can start troubleshooting from there. Tell us a little bit more about your cycling history. Um, I know you've had some really fast times on some bike packing routes. Um, how did you get into all of this and yeah, just give us a little bit of history. Um, so, I mean, if we go way back, I started racing cross country. You know, the back then was Norba, now USA Cycling stuff, you know, and um, and showed no particular promise in any way other than I enjoyed it. But uh, eventually kind of progressed through that up to that expert I'd now um, knocking on the door of Cat One, I guess, um, and getting my doors blown off in a, in a short race. <laughs> but put me in a little bit longer race and, and then I could, could contend. So I kind of launched off from like 12 hours into 24 hours. I played a lot in that 24 hour solo racing world. Um, but that genre started to die off. Um, as the bike packing thing was starting to take a bigger mainstream upswing, not that they're those two timelines 
totally matched, but it worked out well in my riding and racing career. Um, so yeah, 24 hours dying and I needed, I don't know, something else to, to scratch that itch. So the trans North Georgia was the one that, um, did that for me. And, uh, I just absolutely obsessed over that thing. It's you know 350 miles, maybe 40-ish thousand feet of climbing. Um, it, it's a brutal race. Uh, a lot of technical single track thrown in there, particularly late in the ride. So it just became this whole just how do I get my head around it? How do I tackle all these challenges? How do I improve as a rider to make all of this happen? Um, and that was like a four-year um, endeavor of tackling that race and finally settling. Um, setting, I guess I set three records on that one, um, but finally setting the record that I thought, you know, was sort of like my best possible effort. Like right? you're never going to get a perfect race out of one of these things, um, but that was as close as I could get. I got it, got it under 40 hours, and that was what I thought would stand for a while. And as it did, it stood for for 10 years. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it finally fell. <laughs> yeah, that's I, what records are for. <laughs> exactly to be broken. So. I guess let's fast forward now a little bit. You've done, you've done a lot of, you know, TNGAs, some other races here and there. I know you did the tour divide. So what, why, why the Eastern divide? Why the longest (laughs) mountain bike route in the world? Like, why did you want to take that on and be the first person to take that on? What was the motivation behind that? Um, part of it was not like I'd been asked if I wanted to go back and do tour divide again. And, um, and I couldn't come up with a good reason I wanted to go tackle it. I wasn't so sure. That, um, not that I set some blazing fast time. I just got humbled out there, and I wasn't sure how much better I could do at it, given, I don't know, my current means, I guess. The Eastern Divide, um, I know a lot of the people that are involved in it and just got into conversations um, a little bit about where that was at and how close it was to being completed. Tour Divide now is i mean so blazing fast and if you're not doing something close to 200 miles a day and sleeping three hours a night you're not in contention and yeah maybe 10 15 years ago i would have figured out how to do that but not so much right now (laughs) whereas eastern divide was something that i felt like i could actually have an impact on and and you know when you get to be the first um that sounds really cool on the other hand there's no beta out there on it and that was that was the real challenge was like all right this is kind of the fun. I get to go do all the homework and figure it out, um, which is a bit of foreshadowing of that. My homework was all absolutely useless and I just had to figure it out on the fly every day. So it just, it was new challenges is really what it was about. And that's kind of what I've always tried to do with, with my cycling is, is find something new to push myself on. Um, and if it's not scary if i'm not scared to death of it then i didn't pick the right challenge yeah that's i mean i i give you props because you know all of these these big roots you know being the first person or like doing it in the first year or something like that it is so much more challenging to not only just like physically prepare but just like mentally grasp like all right well you know logistics like food like how challenging is this going to take like who knows how long it's going to take from point a to point b so I give yeah. you a lot of credit for uh, for for doing this. <laughs> it gave me a whole new respect for someone like Stamstead doing the Great Divide route and doing it, you know, mostly blind. Yep. Um, it's and that guy didn't even have a uh, an iPhone to plug some music in and take oh. his head out of the game. So that's you know, it's so le- next level. I know it's they were definitely a little bit harder back then for sure. Right? It's just <laughs> not not as not as easy to do. So talk to us a little bit about you were you were supporting Georgia Cycling Association during this ride. Um, you raised a bunch of money for them. Tell us a little bit yeah. more about that. Yeah, so um, I'm one of the founding members of the the Georgia Cycling Association. And um, I mean, the long story short there is we start off, we started off with NICA and then moved on um, to our own entity. Um, so just to give some people, I, at least that are familiar with the NICA platform, it's, it's obviously very similar. Um, so middle through high school kids. Um, and we got that rolling nine years ago. Um, and, uh, and I've been on the board of directors about as long as we've had a board of directors, so maybe eight years. So it's just something I've been really involved in and really believe in um i mean 10 years on nine years on now um you know in the shops where i do my fittings it's you know all these kids that have come out of the well they're not kids anymore you know the 20 something year olds that have have been through the league and come up through that and they're still interested in cycling and involved in cycling and it's 
um, not just the coworkers. Now it's customers that come in. So it's really cool to see it kind of come full circle of they got involved and now they're staying in the sport and, uh, and they're getting to an age where they can start contributing back into the cycling community and who knows what comes from that. So it's, it's pretty awesome to, to see it grow from, yeah, this kid's having a great time on a bike to these young adults are, are now about to take over the world and, and see what they can bring to the cycling community. As I did with Tour Divide five years ago and, and this one sort of a, you know, do a pledge per mile. Um, you know, if I get someone to pledge a penny on a 6,000 mile ride, then we'll, we'll raise some money. <laughs> so, uh, we did that right now. It's around $41,000 that I've raised through the Eastern divide route, um, ride. And, um, that is still open. If anybody's interested, um, you can look, uh, look up tackling, tackling the trail, um, at EO day, Eastern divide, any of that will, should bring it to the site. Um, but we had live tracking and, you know, through track leaders and, some information about the route and sort of my why and of course sponsors um, all out there so that people can get an idea what this thing was all about. Um, and that also, you know, put some eyeballs on the Eastern Divide route too that um, I thought was pretty cool. It was just sort of a, you know, GCA was front and center for it, but but getting more people just uh, aware that the route exists. And, uh, and we do have this other monster route here in the U.S. that they, certainly could be tackled. And I will link that link in the description below. Oh, um, appreciate that. And that should be uh, easy to find. So let's dive into kind of the route itself and your experience. So what bike did you take? And what uh, it, would you change that bike after after completing the Eastern Divide? Um, so I used um, a Rodeo Labs uh, steel flannel. There were certainly times during the ride, and I'll expand on that a little bit, I used uh, 650 wheels with some mountain bike tires and some redshift uh, handlebar stem, so a little suspension up front and their suspension seat post in the back. So, you know, all of 20 millimeters of, of active um, suspension. Um, so not much, obviously. And um, I ran very light, um, you know, one pair of shorts, pair of shorts and a tank top to sleep in. Like I had not even a sleeping bag with me. Um, it was really warm enough. I didn't think I'd need it. So I was just trying to run as light as I could. If you had asked me maybe 1500 miles into the ride, um, through, particularly after the Canadian sections, did I have the right bike? I probably would have said no, because it was really rough up there. And I was just getting, you know, I mean, at times I even had bruised palms. Um, and I was like, man, I should have, should have used a mountain bike. Um, but by the time I got down to the keys, I was like, actually, no, I think I had the right bike. And, you know, I'd say it worked for 80 to 85% of the route. And I'm not sure you're going to find a bike that, that can do more than that. Um, you know, throw, you know, a mountain, even a hardtail in there. I probably have to rebuild that fork at least twice in that route. I mean, at 6,000 miles, it's going to wear out. And, uh, and what happens when that does wear out, you know, does, is it losing air pressure and diving on me and, um, just so many, I don't know, so many other things to deal with. So at the end of the day, I think it was the right bike. If anything, I'd, I'd use their Thai version, but it just wasn't available at the time when I was um, doing the build. Um, that just would have saved a little bit of weight. And I don't know that it would have changed the compliance anymore or less, but you know, less moving parts is sometimes better on such a long route. For sure. Yep. What was your, uh, drive train? Like what was your gearing for, uh, <laughs> that changed a bit throughout, but I, um, I was using, um, SRAM AXS. So a mix of, uh, rival and, um, Eagle components. Um, so I started with a 40 tooth chain ring with a, um, 10 50 cassette. Uh, and I knew that was a little stout, but there wasn't the, there was a lot more volume of climbing coming later in the route. So my plan was to, to put a smaller chain ring on there. Um, so in, uh, just outside of Syracuse, New York, um, at the shop, that was a sort of a planned overhaul of the bike. I put a 36 ring on there. I probably should have gone straight to a 34, but that crank set did not accept that. Mm. Um, so then later on in Asheville, I put a 32 on, um, as I barely struggled through some monster climbing days to get into Asheville, I was very thankful to have that 32. And I left that on for the rest of the route. There was some some thought of going back to a bigger chain ring for Florida. But the reality is um, you don't have big descents in Florida. Right? Obviously, you don't have the big climbs. 
um, but you don't have the big descents where you need a big chain ring to, to carry that speed. I could max out on that 32 somewhere around you know, between 25 and 30 miles an hour, depending on how my legs felt. And there's really not that many places unless you have a major tailwind that you're going to spin out on that um, or I'm going to spin out on that. So it's just, I just left it alone. It was just easier to not, not change one more thing. Totally. So to add on that a little bit, any major mechanicals? I'm sure you ran into a few. Most of the mechanicals were with the brakes and it was a bit of a learning curve. Um, I broke rule number one of ultra anything is don't use anything new and everything on that bike was brand new because I just <laughs> with all the supply chain issues and getting parts in the earlier part of this year that bike didn't come together until like a month before and I didn't even do an overnight trip on that bike before I left like I just everything you're not supposed to do yep. if the um, in that regard so all of it was brand new so some of these issues I would have figured out if I'd had gone out and done some rides um, but with the weather and the heavy bike and there's still plenty of climbing up in the, the Canadian portions of that route. Um, I was wearing through brake pads pretty quickly and the pro so I'd run through the pad too far. The pistons would push in, then you put new pads in there and they would never seem to open back up. So I bleed a little pressure off and then it would pad wears down. And so I go from either pads dragging or my brakes are totally fading. And it just took me a lot while to figure out the equilibrium there of don't let your pads wear out so far, replace them sooner. Um, and I, you know, from halfway on, I was fine. I just went through a lot of brake pads, I think probably 10 sets in total. Um, and that's, you know, those brakes are not designed for a 55 pound bike and, um, they're, that's a road brake. Yep. Um, so, uh, you know, with some more research and time and thought towards it, maybe I would have done a dual tip piston, something, a bigger rotor, or whatever, but I, but I did, um, a couple of flats here and there, not, um, one in the front that caused a crash and went down on the drive side, um, 45 degree angle to the stem to the wheel now. And, uh, that was a, a fun hour or so of just trying to get my bike back together and, and, you know, get my hanger straight ish. I'd already gone through all of the hangers I had at that point. Um, and it was luckily only maybe 200 miles until I could get another one. So I just had you know, a couple of bad days of horrible shifting yep. uh, until I could get that sorted out. And that's, that's it. I mean, for 6,000 miles, it's pretty, pretty crazy. Um, how few I had, thankfully, because yep. I had so many other challenges that, uh, the bike didn't need to add to. Right. Um, well, let's get to the route a little bit. So what was, what was your favorite part of the route or favorite parts? The most hated and the most loved was, uh, the Canadian sections. Um, a, a lot of that is cause it's just totally new areas to me. Um, you know, there's after, I don't know, 25 years of riding, the new stuff is always the best stuff, something I've never seen before. Um, and things like running into moose and, um, I had a female, uh, cow jump out in the trail right in front of me, like 10 feet in front of me. Um, and you know, you got these eight foot stilts slamming into the ground, sounds like thunder and a train in front of you. It's really wild. Um, so just absolutely new experiences like that, um, was pretty cool. Most of the rest of the route, aside from say, um, you know, Georgia and, and about half of the Alabama section was, was pretty new to me, which all of that is great. I love that stuff. Um, and just sort of every day is going to be something basically brand new, um, it's also exhausting to constantly have something brand new and nothing you're familiar with at all. Um, but it's super cool. Um, and then just sort of connections that I have through the whole route. I grew up in new England, um, as a kid. And so I knew some of that area, but to be able to get out and explore it on a bike, um, all of that was super cool. I'd spend summers in Western New York. So to like go through that part and I've got tons of family out there. My parents came out, cousins came out, aunt and uncles, um, so all of that was super cool. And then into my, you know, sort of, uh, adult life backyard, which is all of the South and all through North Carolina and Georgia, Alabama, um, even Florida, some of that's familiar, just slightly different than what I've done. What was, I guess, one of the weirdest, uh, things you saw along the way? <laughs> um, I guess aside from the, uh, very close proximity to several moose, um, weirdest thing um crashing a wedding was a first okay um, yeah <laughs> and uh 
well, tell us a little bit more about that. It, was it just like a, a perfect timing situation? Basically, yeah. I had uh, um, stopped at this campground in Maine, and um, campground's probably an understatement. I mean, they've got cabins and just vast RV things and a general store and a restaurant. Um, so I decided to stay. So I'm sitting at the bar having a few beers, make friends with the locals. And, of course, I stand out because I'm just, you know, in a kit. So they're like, what are you doing? Yeah. Well, I'm riding from here to here, and they're all, you know, super stoked about that. Anyways, there's a wedding going on on the property, and the someone comes in and basically kind of invites all the locals over to to uh, participate, and they're like, "Oh, you should come over." And I was rather hesitant because, again, how I'm how I'm dressed, and I, I'm definitely going to stand out. Um, but got over there eventually through some egging on from them, and uh, had a met the bride she was super cool uh we got a picture together she thought the whole thing was pretty awesome and then i just got to get myself out of the scene because i knew i was kind of a spectacle but next thing i know i am surrounded by a bunch of people who are letting me know and know on certain terms that they don't think i belong there and uh, uh wow. there was a moment where i couldn't get to my bike through these guys and i wasn't even sure where it went to because it got moved and i'm kind of freaking out and trying to keep my cool because i it's me on fought guys and yeah you know i'm 2000 miles into this so i'm a little underweight for fighting right now sure um <laughs> and uh i mean eventually i got out of there unscathed and apologies were made the next day and we'll, we'll blame it on some uh maybe misinformation misunderstandings and a lot of alcohol and we'll yeah. say on everybody's part i won't blame anybody <laughs> there you go but uh, by far the hardest donation I ever got to GCA, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Oh, um, cool. Any other, like, odd things you saw along the way that stand out? A full piano inside of a tent in the Pisgah Forest. And unfortunately, there was nobody there, nobody playing it, because I so wanted to stop and, like, get the story of how did this happen. Because this is a, um upright piano so it's yeah. not a small thing no um and inside like a four-person tent and it had kind of a screened vestibule and i'm riding by and i'm like is that that is it's a piano like what the heck and a very you know i'd say you'd have to fight drive six seven miles on dirt roads to get to this place and uh yeah so how did that happen and why um, I had so many questions, but there was nobody there. So I just had to keep riding by and then spend the rest of my afternoon wondering what the heck was that? Um, all right. So what was the, the state or province that had the friendliest people? All, all of the Canadian section. I mean, every, every cliche about Canadians being so overly nice is absolutely true and, um, not something I would ever make fun of, uh, because they saved me so many times. Um, I mean, maybe the best moment was uh, coming in. I was on the, along the Fundy Bay in New Brunswick. Just another one of these moments on this route that things I did not expect, like a hike a mile down into a river gorge and another mile out that probably took four hours um, to go two and a half miles. So my whole day, time schedule is messed up. So I get into this town, uh, I think it was St. Martin's, a uh, little coastal town, um, and they have something called the Fundy uh, parkway, which is kind of like a Blue Ridge Parkway kind of thing. Um, so just tourist highway, you know, lots of pullovers and beautiful sites, but nothing in there as far as um, any sort of resupply. Maybe there's water somewhere, but uh, I am killing myself to get through this, um, this park and get on the other side and try to get to this town before absolutely everything closes, which I totally failed to do. So I'm rolling in at like five after nine. And this town has rolled up the sidewalks. Every restaurant is closed down. Um, but I roll into sort of the last gas station on the way out of town. And this guy is like calling every restaurant back for me. Trying to, Everybody that walks in, he's like, oh, Pam, do you know of any restaurant this guy can eat at? And, and everybody seemed to care, though they had no solution. Right. So I roll, um, you know, I get some calories in me. And then I kind of go back and figure out what I'm going to have for dinner, which is now like some macaroni and cheese that I can mix up some, uh, I don't know, chocolate milk and some chips and maybe some beef jerky. It's like the best I can get out of the store. And, uh, he points me towards this campground and uh, probably takes me 
10 minutes to ride up there. By the time I got there, he's called ahead to the owners of the campground. They're basically waiting for me to, uh, and offering to warm up whatever food I had. And so they take care of the mac and cheese and they get me over to my campsite and, uh, I'm setting up my tent while I'm setting up my tent. The guy next door comes over and he's like, Hey, if you need a fire or anything, um, you know, welcome to come join us. And if we go to bed, you can use the fire and help yourself all the firewood. Everybody's so nice. <laughs> and, uh, so I get my tent set up, I go over there and he's, you know, of course got all these questions for me about what I'm doing and why. And, um, and then his wife comes out and there's more questions and, you know, they seem, you know, me kind of snacking away and I'll, she's breaking out hot dogs and cooking them over the fire for me and, you know, bags of leftover vegetables and, just they totally fed me and took care of me and and it like I said it just wasn't one person in this situation from the time I rolled into this town till till I went to bed absolutely everybody was bedding over backwards trying to figure out something for me as much as they talk about southern hospitality the Canadians absolutely own it all (laughs) (laughs) that was maybe one of your biggest or most challenging days but um, obviously you know uh, over this huge route You know, you probably dealt with quite a few challenging days. What was like your top two most challenging days out there? The first one that comes to mind is um, trying to get off of Newfoundland. Um, You have to take a ferry from Port of Basque to uh, Sydney, Nova Scotia, and it's like a seven hour boat ride. Um, So logistically, the whole, you know, and they run basically at noon and midnight um, pretty much every day. Um, as far as I could figure out Canada and particularly Newfoundland that time of year just has a flood of people coming in, um, for lots of reasons. So I get, I don't know, maybe 40 miles into my day, there's a store stop and, um, I get some poutine, which if you're not familiar is fries with cheese and gravy. Um, this particular place would put fried chicken on top of that. Um, yeah, so I got this, you know, tray uh, that's like three pounds of food and um there's actually um a georgia cycling association board meeting so i'm kind of eating my poutine called into that and get through that meeting and then i'm talking to my girlfriend audrey about just the day and i was like you know i think i might be able to make the ferry but there's also a strong chance i can't make the ferry so i should totally call them and see about what i can do with that so i get off the phone with her still eating this three pounds of poutine (laughs) and Um, I start talking to the lady with the ferry company and she's like, "Mm, yeah, so we can't, so it was Friday. Yep. And she's like, well, no, you can't get on for Saturday. Sorry, you can't get on for Sunday. So Monday night would be your best. Oh, that's now adding three days of just going nowhere. Ultimately, I decided to keep my Friday, um, time slot and go ahead and pay for a Monday time slot. And I'm going to race now and do this basically a hundred mile time trial, um, with this 2,500 calories of just poutine grease in my gut. <laughs> <laughs> so I finished the food and I take off and I am getting after it. Um, you know, knowing that it's a hundred miles, right? You got to pace yourself, but I want to get after it and get, you know, you don't want to waste that first hour. That's for sure. And all of a sudden it's like this massive headwind of like 20 miles an hour. And then I get a beasting in my throat and I'm just waiting oh. to see if that turns into something. And then why I'm so focused on that, this car pulls out in front of me and I almost freaking T-bone them. And this is all like in the first 10 minutes. And I'm like, this yeah. is going to go horribly. Yeah. <laughs> 20 minutes later, there's no traffic. The beasting turned out to be just an annoyance. Uh, luckily, I'm not allergic to them. But um, I mean, it was dead center in my throat. Huh. Um, and the wind died down and turned a little more of a crosswind than a headwind. So I just got after it. But then say a six, seven hours later, I'm still 40 miles out and it's just not coming fast enough. Yep. And, um, the downside there is it's ra- old railroad bed. So everything's a 1% grade up, but it's also a 1% grade down and it's big chunky rock. So there's no momentum on the descent. So you're like, I'm getting after it on this climb only to come over the other side. And there's just nothing. Right. You know, there's no coasting. There's no reprieve. You just got to keep doing the same effort. So um, ultimately, that ended up me getting like the last Airbnb available, probably on the whole island. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and missing that ferry and having to sit there for three days. Um, that was, yeah, <laughs> physically, mentally, it was a, it was a, just a challenge of a day to try to make it happen and then fail doing it on top of it. I'd say the second most challenging day was still in Canada. I mean, Canada just beat me down so hard. Um, I'm in Nova Scotia. I'm not even going to try to pronounce the name of the town cause I only half remember it and I'd butcher it if I had it all. Sure. Um, but leave this little town and, um, I am having some serious GI issues. And so I don't really want to leave the hotel, but I think the Imodium is going to do enough to get me on my way. There is no hotel on route for, I think it was 110 miles. I can, I can eat and hold it down. It's just going to be really bad news when it starts working its way through. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I get, I don't know, maybe halfway ish through the day, I get to this town, I eat, I take care of nature, take more Imodium. And I get, I mean, say 10 o'clock that night and I'm not far, maybe, maybe 30 miles out from the hotel and all of that to say like timing of it, I got to be careful when and where I eat because otherwise I'm going to be on the side of the trail for a while. And so that also, you know, plays into my energy levels and just trying to like time everything perfectly so I can cover the ground, but also not be just hanging off a tree, um, getting it eaten up by mosquitoes. And, um, uh, I'm following the route. It's horrible logging roads and they're slow, but whatever I'm plugging along. And I just get to this spot where it says turn left. And it's like, there's nothing here. This is nothing but trees. This road doesn't even exist. And it's just like, what the heck? <laughs> like, this is not the time I need this to be happening. I really right. need to get to that hotel room. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I find a way around that with a lot of cursing and just frustration and, and, and get on the other side of it. I see where they're actually cutting the road in. All the oh. heavy equipment's out there in the forest. And they're, they're making this road. It just doesn't exist yet. Mm. Um, but somehow it exists on a map. And, Weird. And I, I should throw in there, I'm scouting. Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, nobody's ridden any of this stuff. So it's totally foreign to everybody. Okay. Um, everybody being those involved in making the route. It's yep. basically looking at Google Maps and saying, I hope that goes through. I did have to make a stop ultimately <laughs> in the woods and take care of that. And then I get down to um, what seems like it's going to be, it is rail to trail. So I'm thinking this is going to be pretty straightforward. And it's just a nice like 20 mile shot into uh, the town where my hotel is. And I get to the end of the rail to trail or where it says it ends, no more motor vehicles, mm -hmm. uh, no more. And I think it said pedestrian only, um, but it is where the old railroad bed used to go. But underneath the railroad, bed, they put these rocks that are like, you know, two foot chunks stacked on top of each other to make the bed of it. And that's all it is for like two miles. Oh. And that one I backed out of and went to the highway that was adjacent to it. Cause it's like, if I'm scouting, I also get to pick the better route. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So it just added so much more and so many frustrations and, and of course it comes at the end of the day yeah so i did make my my hotel finally probably 1 a.m and uh stopped at the gas station next door got some food and of course i'm up till 3 a.m because once i ate it was starts all over again yeah um i did spend uh i had a short day the next day the day after that i was in the hospital getting three liters of fluid pumped back into me and antibiotics to get whatever was going on inside of me to die and move on <laughs> Jeez. that's an experience i i really was thinking there that might be the end of the ride i mean to get into the next day i i just couldn't even leave i got to the next town maybe 45 miles in and i just couldn't leave that town yeah i just emodium was not doing it anymore and i was getting exhausted because i couldn't hold any you know everything's just blowing right through me so i'm not absorbing any of the nutrients and doing big days on top of it that just was a recipe for for bad news, but the antibiotics worked quick. I mean, that next day after the hospital, I did a 95 mile day and uh, was right back into it. Um, awesome. I won't say I was fully recovered, but you know, mentally I was ready to get there. Yeah. Well, fast forward to the Florida Keys, what, 79 total days? 78 days. 78 days. 11 hours, 59 minutes, and I think it was 36 seconds. And what was um, the total mileage by by the end? Um, Six thousand plus. Yeah, I had sixty two something. Okay. If my elevation is to be trusted, because um, I know GPSs are kind of all over the place on that, yeah. uh, I had forty uh, four hundred 
20 something thousand feet of climbing. Um, so way more than advertised in both the mileage and the climbing. Um, the mileage, the extra mileage comes from a lot of that scouting and having to backtrack. And, um, but also there's so many points on that route that you're just a few miles from that resupply. And you're like, oh, do I go in there? Do I not go in there? At some point you have to, you got to get more food and water. Um, and not knowing sort of every little intricacy of the route, I erred more towards being cautious of making sure I had food and water. So I added a lot of miles, you know, and just, you know, five or six of those a day, that's going to add up over 78 days. So. so I guess the last question then for you is what advice would you give folks wanting to tackle the whole route? Um, be glad you're not the first. Um, <laughs> Maybe let another 10 people go and find some more beta, but uh, um, they're, the route's fully published now, so one could go and do a lot more homework than I did. A bit of the backstory there is I had access to what I thought was the route um, that turned out to be, I guess, sort of an older um, project account with Rywood GPS that was out there that was like three years old. So all the homework that I did turned out to not actually be the route at all. Oh, so the route has been published. Now you can go do the homework on the actual route. Um, depending if I can find the time, I may go back and do some of that myself. Cause I do have notes from what I was doing, some overlap of what I did study and actually make, um, made notes on, I could probably merge that together and have a pretty decent cue sheet for somebody. Um, so I'd like to do that and put it out there to the world, but it's all about, Time. I also have to go back to work. Exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, really, the best thing you can do is do the homework and and start studying the route and making making cue sheets, um, and be prepared for uh, a lot of things you just don't know are going to come. And I, I I don't know how to tell you to prepare for that other than be mentally open for it. Like uh, hurricanes and such. Yeah, I mean that's a big part of that route. It, it being as long as it is, um, and covering so many different, uh, regions, um, there's five different time zones from Newfoundland. You got to have at least decent weather up there, right? You can't start real early, um, because of snow and mud, but, and if you did say start in June and you're on a, even the, the same path that I did, you're going to be into Florida and it's going to be 110 degrees through the center of Florida and crazy humid, um, and you're going to wilt down there. Um, and there's just, it's so hard to get enough water at that time of year. Um, if you go try to go the other way and go from south to north, you're going to run into, um, you can start in Florida with some mild weather and say the beginning of April or even late March. Um, but if you go too fast, you're going to get into the snow and mud in the northern sections. And a lot of people think of just the snow part, but they have this whole transition time where that snow's melting off and just everything is Mud season. Yeah. wet. Um, so it's, it's definitely a, a puzzle. Um, I obviously went with my best guess, which was that August 1st start. It was actually pretty intense up there. The sun's really intense. You gotta be really careful with, um, sunburn. Um, I thought I would go faster and have to deal with more of the heat in Florida, but I kind of got the perfect weather all the way down. Um, I think I only had one night, um, and that was actually in North Carolina, uh, in up high and high for the East Eastern divide, um, at like 4,000 feet. And right. I think it got down to about 40. Hmm. Um, and again, I didn't have a sleeping bag. I had a puffy jacket and rain pants for those nights. And so that was, uh, you know, throw an emergency blanket over and just doing the best I could that night. <laughs> we could, we could probably talk for hours on this. I'd love oh, to, sure. um, but I mean, I, I, I definitely appreciate the time that we've taken so far. I know that you probably have inspired a few humans to, uh, to probably tackle the uh, Eastern Divide here. Um, I hope so. And, uh, and if anybody ever has questions, certainly you know, they can reach out to me directly. Um, I'm not that hard to find on, on yeah, what Instagram. Yeah, what's your, what's your Instagram handle? It's Eddie O'Day. Um, and that's O-D-E-A. Perfect. All right, Eddie. Well, thanks so much for the time, and uh, we, we really appreciate it, and well done. Yeah, man, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.